Okay, I think we'll start. It's a great pleasure today to come back to introduce a former, well, actually a colleague still, but, but uh, we worked together at Case Western for 20 years, Bob Mullen. A um, little tongue-in-cheek here. There's an imposter out there. You guys have ever seen Das Equus, the most interesting man in the world? Yes. It's actually him. <laughs> okay, so, so, so there's three words that describe him. I, I'll take the liberty of describing him also as a colleague and friend. Uh, the first one, and for those of you who have met with him today and have talked to him for, for, for a few minutes, uh, 14th century Middle English word, I think. Uh, Charles, you could tell me whether this is correct. It's uh, disarming. He has a disarming personality, very, very pleasant to be with. Also, he has a very, very brilliant and fertile mind who works across all fields. Um, after graduating from Northwestern, we did some seminal work on integration algorithms for fluid structure interaction problems. Uh, he went on and developed a career which is very, very broad and wide, which is actually kind of an inspiration to me when I joined uh, his department as an assistant professor. He works in general on computer modeling of engineering systems. He's done a lot of work in biomechanics. If you get into a barroom fight and they break your jaw, the surgical procedures they use today to get you to eat within a few days are due to his work on demystifying the biomechanics of the mandible and the upper face. Uh, he worked with that with Randy Rutherman, I yeah. think, a plastic surgeon. He also, so he, he works in bio biomechanics quite a lot. He's done some early work, some, er, some of the early work on the mechanics of microelectromechanical systems. He has several patents, including surgical instruments based on MEMS devices. Uh, he works a lot on coupled wheel problems, including drying of paints and such things. He did a lot of the early work in civil engineering on computer vision to image damage and roads and decks and such things. And uh, more recently, he's been working a lot on interval methods, which he'll talk about today. And he also does a lot of work in entrepreneurship. Uh, the more you talk to him, the more you find out some of the stuff that he does that you never knew he did. He's actually involved in Southeast Asia with a very large consortium to do biofuels, to have actually uh, farms growing palm oil all over Southeast Asia, which they use to actually develop biofuels and other things. So anyway, with that, um, today he's going to talk about basically some methods that he's been developing to to basically to make more efficiency the analysis of structures. Okay, so Bob? Yeah. Well, uh, I was actually worried about the introduction because Roberto knows uh, more about me than I care to be shared uh, at a general audience, but uh, I won't respond to any of your comments. Uh, but uh, I do think, you know, that being engineers, uh, you know, one of the things that I see as a goal is not the end of my work being a paper, but if I can find a product on a shelf or, you know, this is a device that's in an operating room, I feel that I accomplish more for, you know, humanity. And therefore, I'm not necessarily satisfied to stop it and hand off the work to somebody else. Uh, uh, so if you have good colleagues and they're willing to put up with you, and you have good administration that will give you a little bit more time uh, to do something because you may decide that I'm going to do something you know, that may not be completely scholarly, uh, you can have a lot of fun. And uh, you know, I still uh, uh, remember fondly having Roberto next to me in a uh, uh, next door office and you know, we'd yell at each other, you can't do that, Mullen, you can't spell, what's the problem here? You know, and we actually worked together pretty well because Roberto concentrates on d details and it has to be perfect. I mean, if it's not perfect, I don't know if you know him very well, but it will. he really wants things right. And I have a tendency to get the broad picture, write down something, and then say, oh, well, you know, uh, I didn't really mean it's x squared. It's x to some power, and I'm not sure what it is. And Roberto would uh, correct all those uh, problems, and together we were a pretty productive team. Uh, so uh, I miss having you uh, close by, and I know now in Houston you're closer than you were in Minnesota, and about uh, halfway in between is some swamp in Louisiana. I actually found out on, uh, uh, you know, where the halfway point is, and I think neither of us would want to meet there. So, uh, But uh, I appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk 
primarily to graduate students. Uh, uh, I know how the seminar series worked at uh, both uh, South Carolina and Case at Northwestern. You know, you get people coming in and they were there to show you the latest high power, clever piece of math that they did. And as a graduate student, you know, I would listen and then I'd have to go back to the library and spend two or three hours trying to figure out what the person said. Um, so don't hesitate to ask me questions. Uh, and I'm going to take a little bit of different view of the seminar and try to do what turns out to be what I thought was going to be a really simple problem. And by using simple models, actually develop a solution that turned out to be a little bit more complex than you would think to begin with. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about looking at probabilistic analysis of structures, and the reason I got interested into this field is because I read too many papers where they said we're going to assume that the distribution is normal and that all the variables are independent. Okay, and there was never any justification for that. I mean, you know, some people actually justify why the distribution is a normal distribution based on you know additive decomposition and large numbers or something. Uh, but a lot of times that distribution was made, or that those assumptions were made purely because it made the problem easy to solve. And you know, that may be good for a mathematician. That may be good for a scientist who's trying to calculate some strange behavior out at the edge of what we can measure nowadays. But as an engineer, we want to make sure that the assumptions are actually valid. And if they're not valid, what the impact of those assumptions are going to be on the end result of my design. So, let me, okay, as an engineer, I don't know how to use a, a projector. To, uh, okay, uh, and I'd like to thank a couple of colleagues that I've been working with on this uh, sort of imprecise probability issue. Uh, one is Rafi Mohanu, who's down at Georgia Tech. And then uh, uh, Professor Ramaral, who's in Hyderabad, is an interesting case. We've communicated for about six years over Skype. And I finally met him in Chicago uh, this uh, summer, which is the first time we actually met in person. And in the meantime, we published uh, you know, five or six papers uh, just by exchanging information over the uh, internet. Okay. And, um, the other thing I like to do, uh, which is sort of unusual, is you know you you reference people whose work you take, you know that, that you you know, have a reference to a particular citation. Uh, you acknowledge the colleagues that you work with, but there are a group of people that are responsible in part for this work, whose only real association is we meet at conferences and we discuss things over beer, uh, and. Uh, you know, these are people who ask the right questions. You know, they've influenced my work uh, for various reasons. Uh, Eva Babushka is a great finite element guy, and uh, you know, I had a graduate student, and he just sort of took the graduate student under his wing, sat down at a conference, and said, "You know, Bart, uh, let's look at your problem. You know, let's. This is a function. We can show this limit. You can't get a lower limit. Nobody's been able to prove this." And he just volunteered his time to help students uh, uh, do well. Uh, Vlad Krenovich can come up with an algorithm that saves you know, half the computer time just by reordering operators. So you know, I come with something and it's slow and chunky and uh, Roberto come with things that are really slow and really chunky so I should introduce you because, uh, and he would say, well if you sort this, it's a log, you know, an n log n algorithm and then after it's sorted you can do the compare at n times and now you're, you know, you can compute it, and otherwise you can't. Ray Moore is the grandfather of integral arithmetic. Uh, so he, back in the 50s, he developed the techniques that are being used by me now to develop uh, bounds. Uh, and uh, Ray Moore's uh, granddaughter was actually in one of my strength and materials class. You know, I, you know, students occasionally ask you what you're doing for research. You know, and I said, oh, I'm working on intervals. And this, this. Uh, student said, oh, my grandfather did something. Who's your grandfather? Ray Moore. Well, he discovered the thing. You know? So it's always a small uh, uh, community that we work in. You know, I meet people here, and you find out we, we have uh, similar uh, colleagues all over the world. Uh, uh, Arnold Neumeyer, a mathematician 
uh, in Vienna. And he just happened to ask the right questions. You know, have you considered looking at constraints? Have you considered looking at fixed point operators? You know, I think those were the two things he asked me. And they solved problems that we had that we were struggling with for a long period of time. So he seems to think of the right you know, additional point that we're missing. And Scott Fairson is the developer of this concept of pea boxes. He's actually a biologist. He worries about species going extinct, but the math is the same. And therefore, we communicate in math. Uh, and you know, every time I see him, I pick up a new idea. He says he gets ideas from me, too, but I'm not sure. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge those before I continue. Well, I'm going to talk mostly about a toy problem. You know, this is something that you would give an undergraduate to do. It's a two-dimensional truss. It's got, well, it's, these are statically determined. It is not uh, important. Uh, it's got some loading on it. Uh, the reason I'm looking at a truss is it's easy to analyze. But at the same time, you can generalize it to almost any finite element formulation. Okay? And the question that I want to solve is I have three loads. And I have information on the distribution of each one of those loads. Uh, a lot of times when you look at statistical data, you actually are only looking at what is called marginal data. You, you want to know what the com combined wind loading and uh, scour effects are going to be at a bridge. So you go look at somebody's wind loading data at one location, measured at one time. You look at the uh, flow rates measured at a particular location at another time. And then you have to put these together because the real probability distribution depends on both variables. Yeah. Um, and what's commonly done as engineers is to say, well, it's independent. And then you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and and uh, so the question is, is, what's the difference between actually getting a probability distribution in three dimensions or n dimensions versus just having the marginal distributions that look at single variables at a time? Simple problem, shouldn't take long for somebody to solve it. Uh, uh, you hope the answer is there's not a big effect because a lot of engineers make the assumption that if things are independent. Um, you know, the, the typical engineering solution is I'm going to assume civil, that things are independent and I'm just going to forget about it. That's a quote from the forget about it is a comment that Roberto uh, very often makes. You know. Anyway, that's just forget about it. Uh, but if you look at the uh, details, I mean, all you got to do is look at a, a truck on the highway. And to say that the load at one point is going to be independent when that truck spans almost the structure, it's hard to believe that that assumption is going to be valid. Okay? And there's all sorts of examples where dependency was miscalculated and you end up with failures. I mean, trivial examples. Uh, you have a feed water pump at a nuclear reactor. You measure the reliability of the pump. You put three of them there. You multiply the reliability times each other, or the probability of failure. So you know, one is, fails one in a million. You put them together, and it's going to fail one, in, uh, one to the minus 18th power, right? Just multiply the, the three together. Okay? But if your failure mechanism is a tsunami wave that floods out the room, you don't get any additional reliability from having two more pumps because they're all going to fail in perfect correlation uh, in those scenarios. And therefore, the dependency leads to incorrect, in this case, disastrous results. Uh, and you can say the same thing has happened in the, the financial markets when, you know, what's the probability of uh, somebody defaulting on a loan? What's the probability of two houses fault defaulting on a loan? And then all of a sudden, the economy goes bad and house prices stop. Uh, uh, inflating, and now you have a, a progressive collapse through the entire economy. And the people who did the analysis had very complicated dependency models. They actually had Gaussian uh, coppolas. But they missed the extreme events, and they assumed that the data that they had represented the uh, dependency correctly. And when that fails, uh, you end up with very significant effects. Okay. So what I'm going to do today is talk about how do you de represent dependency. And there's a couple of methods, and you've probably heard of all of them. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, details of different ways to represent dependency and what their implications are. 
Uh, two that I'm going to talk about is uh, parametric models, talk about things like correlation, and then talk about coppolas, which is a general way of looking at the dependency effects in multidimensional probability distributions compared to the marginals. Um, second thing I'm going to talk about is how do you represent what you don't know? You know it's easy to represent knowledge. Well, maybe not easy, but you know, you think you know what you know, but it's what you don't know. How do you measure the ignorance, the, uns the, the lack of knowledge in a system? Uh, then I'm going to look at some even more toy problems. We're going to look at bounds of very simple arithmetic operators. You know, they got a probability distribution for A and a probability distribution for B, and I add them together. Can I predict the probability distribution for A and B without making the assumption that they are dependent or independent? or correlated, you know, what's the bounds that I can do on that? And I have a big interest or a large interest in bounds because I think they address a lot of problems that we're not addressing well. Uh, things like how do you do model variation of validation? You know, uh, climate change people take five models, average them together, give you a result. Uh, you know, that's, the average is the validated model. Uh, people do things like in South Carolina we look at uh, hurricanes every once in a while. And so far we've been really lucky. There was, I've experienced more hurricanes in Cleveland than I have in South Carolina. I'm not sure that's a good statistic that I should propagate forward. Uh, but when you know, I look at the weather reports and they have hurricane models, they just show all the model predictions. So you get these spaghetti diagrams that says, you know, this model predicts the hurricanes hitting New York. This one says Bermuda. This one says it's going to loop around and hit Houston. Uh, you know, and you just present all the data and you let the user decide how you're going to represent the models. But another way to look at validating or interpreting multiple models is to just develop bounds. And I think bounds are underused by engineers because we've been trained to get right numbers. You know, the, I remember faculty who said, you know, the answer isn't six pounds, it's 6.25 pounds. Uh, and then I had other faculty who said, it's not 6.52 pounds, it's six pounds, that's as good as you're going to get. Um, but we're trained for a single answer. Um, I'm going to represent a technique that does probabilistic calculations on bounds uh, based on what's called a P-box, uh, probability box, but you know, everybody's got their own jargon and got to make it shorter. Uh, yeah. People are willing to bet on that. I mean, uh, I was at, oh, sorry. Uh, the question is, how can you ever believe a model about credit default swaps? Um, my answer is that there is really some serious work. When I was an undergrad, I actually worked for some professors at the University of Chicago who did stock price models. And one of them actually won a Nobel Prize for the Black-Scholes equation, it was Scholes. And they represent the value of an option, which is a risk transfer. Same sort of, you know, the risk on this bridge, I'm going to transfer over to this bridge. The way you do it is detours. I mean, you just put a posted sign and say you've got to go 20 miles around, you've shifted the risk. You really don't. But, uh, uh, the, uh, and so there are models that predict, but they have restrictions. I mean, the, the, the Black-Scholes equation assumes that all the uncertainty you can express by the variance in the uh, observed uh, price over a period of time. So the variance represents all the uncertainty. It's symmetric and it's wrong. And you, you know, if you invest in options, you know it's wrong because the options not, the price of the stock's not going to be negative. Um, I think Roberto, oh, this, um, at, sorry, at Case Western, um, we used to get faculty benefits for spouses um, in tuition. And they would pay you uh, the tuition money on your check, but you never got it. I mean, it was deducted. And I seem to remember Roberto getting a check from the university where they put the entire tuition for uh, Susan on one check uh, and then claimed that you had a negative, uh, you know, the check was a negative amount. Uh, you know, you never get stock values less than zero. It's not a symmetric problem. You can't use variance. You should correct for it. 
Uh, but people use the model anyway. I mean, it gives you some information. They're just like engineers, you know. We, don't, we know linear elasticity is not going to describe everything, but it sure is useful. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to present a couple of simple results and then uh, conclude. So I'm, uh, as usual, uh, as a faculty member, I'm talking a lot more than getting through my slides, so I'll try to speed things up a little bit. Uh, uh, one of the ways to represent dependency is to pick a particular distribution that has dependency among variables, you know, multidimensional Gaussian distributions, okay? And then just say I have parameters that represent the dependency. In this case here, in multidimensions, it's the correlation coefficient that's going to tell you whether the variables are dependent or not, because if the off-diagonal terms are zero, the whole system is decoupable into two independent marginal distributions. Okay? So you can calculate dependency if you assume an underlying distribution. Okay. And you can realize these things, they have the behavior that you would expect. You know, this is just the realization of a couple, uh, I think about 100 points. Uh, the top one has a correlation coefficient of 0.9, so you can see a linear relationship. This has a correlation of 0.1, it looks like a shotgun. This is minus 0.45, so it's a little bit biased in this direction, and this is minus so you get the behavior expect. It's got the right dependency or relationship between the two variables. And I can add these two variables together. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to try to eventually get to dependency bounds over just adding two variables. And this is a manifold that's just generated with a dependency of one. So you add the two normal distributions, and you just get a normal distribution that's twice as big. A dependency of minus one, so you get zero all the time because you're adding symmetric pairs, and any of the dependencies in, the, in between are going to be inside this manifold, and therefore if I wanted to develop bounds and I was Gaussian, I didn't know what the correlation was, I can define a shape here that would represent all the possible dependencies between Gaussian correlated variables. Okay? Now, one of the tricks I could use to look at other distributions is to map one distribution onto another. And this is just a functional transformation. Uh, and uh, you can map uniform distributions onto Gaussian and vice versa. And we're going to use it a little bit later on. Uh, so one of the things you can do is if I have a Gaussian variable here and a uniform distribution here, if I know Gaussian distributions, I can put Gaussian numbers here, pull uni uniform off. If I have uniform variables, I can put uniform in, get Gaussian out. Easy to do the transformation. It's just a nonlinear map. So if I have a couple of uniform distributions, I can generate correlated uniform distributions. This is a uniform distribution that has a correlation coefficients of 0 0.9, 0 0.45, minus 0.45, and minus 0.9. So it sort of correspond to the other ones, except this one gets more of a box instead of a circle. You'd expect that because of the origin of the problem. Okay. Now, and I can add these. And I can get a distribution, manifold of distributions of adding two uniform random distributions between 0 and 1. Again, you know, if they're exactly correlated, it's a distribution that goes from 0 to 2. Not surprising. If it's a uh, negative 1 correlation, it's a fixed value at 1. And uh, I should be able to develop bounds that almost would look like uh, two pyramids on top of each other, or two triangles. I mean, there would be a linear bound here vertical bound here, and a function that's in this space, and this space would bound the probability distributions. Okay? Now, if that was right, I probably wouldn't be telling you. Yeah. So the question is, is correlation a good measure of a dependency? And this you probably realize as an undergrad in your statistics class. It's an easy measure, but it's the linear dependency that you're extracting. It's the first term in a long series, just like the uh, Black-Scholes equation uses variance as a measure of risk because it's the first term in a long series. Um, and uh, uh, Scott Ferrison actually verifies that all these points have zero correlation. And while I'm not sure what the structure is in some of these, um, it's clear that a lot of these have very uh, identifiable structure and have a lot of dependency and yet have zero correlation. So saying that you're going to look at the problem of that bridge, but just by varying correlation functions, is not going to be good enough. Okay. So the real question is, is what 
can I do when I don't know anything about the distribution? Okay. Well, there may be hope. Instead of doing a Taylor series expansion type uh, operator, let me try to look at the function as uh, the dependency as maintaining some functional characteristic. So one of the other techniques for looking at dependency between uh, random variables, especially the marginal random variables and getting the whole distribution, uh, the idea is to separate issues doing, that have to do with dependency from issues that have to do with the individual vector distributions. Okay? And the idea, again, is it's fairly simple. You take the, the probability density function that you would have for uh, you know, two-dimensional space and convert the way you plot it so that you make the marginal distributions uniform. Okay? So I, whatever the distribution is, I go back to that same figure, I, I look at the cumulative probability distribution and transform it so that the points turn out to have a uniform distribution. Okay? Then the only thing left is going to be how the dependency of those two variables are going to be when I plot the results from the transform variables that have to do with uniform distribution. So once I make the, uni the marginal distributions the same, the picture that remains only depends on the dependency. Okay? And that's what a copula is. And uh, if all it was was a new way to plot data, nobody would pay attention. But copulas have bounds. And these are three uh, descriptions of bounds. This is the uh, probability distribution of variable one. This is the probability distribution of variable two. And the top is the probability distribution for that event. Okay? And th all possible surfaces are not allowed. First of all, since this is actually a cumulative distribution, it has to be monotonically non-decreasing. It could be flat or going up when you write it in either one of these two variables away from the origin. Okay? Uh, just for information, this, was a, this is what an independent uh, distribution looks like. Uh, but there are two bounds. This is a lower bound and an upper bound that uh, uh, come from Frechet uh, that the function has to be between. So even if I have any dependency, and when I talk about any dependency, it means anything that's allowed mathematically, um, I still have restrictions on my solution. So certain combinations just aren't allowed. Okay? And these two bounds are going to allow me to extend uh, the any correlation results to actually calculate what's going to happen when you have uh, any dependency between two variables, but you know the marginal distribution. So you've measured variable A, you've measured enough of variable B, you have statistics, you have data, you curve fit, you have some representation of the displacement or the probability distribution. What's the worst it could be? And again, when I talk with undergraduate engineers, they have this mindset that independent has the most uncertainty. I'm not sure what uncertainty means in that respect, but uh, it has the most uncertainty, and therefore it must be the worst case, because it's the hardest one for me to predict. And of course, the, the dependent, you know, even from the previous cases, you could see that the uh, sum of two random variables gives you something that are independent is actually a curve right in the middle of those. Okay. Uh, the bounds on the copulas can be generated to multiple dimensions. So going from one dimension to n dimensions is just more work, and it's hard to graph. Okay. Okay. So uh, before I give you a solution to adding variables, et cetera, let me talk a little bit about, so we're going to use the copulas to represent any dependency. How do you represent ignorance? And this is also something that bothers me uh, when I see colleagues making extrapolations. Uh, um, there are uh, a number of, oh, shoot, 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 shoot. Yeah, this, okay. Uh, one of the very common ways of measuring ignorance is to use entropy. I mean, this is the great contribution of Claude Shannon. Uh, and I don't know where that equation came from because it's not in I was going to say English, but it's not in math. Uh, the, uh, uh, it should say that the uh, ignorance is minus some constant. Uh, P is the sum of the probability of some event, uh, log P some event. Okay? And Shannon was able to prove with very little assumptions 
that that's a unique expression for something that represents ignorance. And the minus sign is nice, you know. Um, because what he says is, you know, that, that's the information that you don't know. That's the, the perfectly random case. This is no information, okay? So maximizing entropy means completely random. Okay? He was able to prove that that's the only expression, but it was based on four assumptions. Uh, or four requirements. First of all, the expression has to be symmetric. You've got to be able to switch variables. There should be no bias in one, measure, one piece of information than another. F uh, function has to be continuous. You couldn't be ignorant and all of a sudden know everything, uh, even though students seem to work that way. You know, it doesn't make any sense, and now it's perfectly clear. I work the same way, but Shannon didn't allow that. Uh, <laughs> Um, it should be independent of how you put the parts together, and that was really the key. If I had like 10 different probability of events, and I grouped them in 5 and 5, or 4 and 6, or 10 individual ones, I should get the same number. You know, the, the, how I group things together shouldn't affect the answer. And uh, uh, if I add possibilities, I have to be more ignorant. You know? If I know that the right number for this problem is two or four, and then somebody says, but Bob, you forgot three, all of a sudden I'm dumber because I have more choices. And with those assumptions, you can prove that that expression is unique, but what most people forget is the proof requires that the number of variables be finite. Okay? So entropy measures are provable to be unique only if you have a finite number of events. Uh, and there's some other problems, too. Um, the history of maximum entropy goes back uh, to uh, uh, Laplace, I think, who said, you know, probability is not a, a, de a frequency-dependent uh, uh, behavior. Probability is the degree of my de belief. And if I don't know what I'm doing, I will define equal probabilities. It's sort of like principle of insufficient reason is what he called it. Um, I call it lucky guesses, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, it's going to be 50-50, you know. Um, the um, problems with maximum entropy, in addition to going beyond when you have one to do to continuous cases and non-countable cases, um, it doesn't distinguish between uh, ignorance and uncertainty. I mean, it's very possible that I have a coin that if I flip, it's going to be 50-50. It's really a fair coin. And I know it's going to be 50-50, and I can actually use that as an engineer to make calculations and predictions. Um, versus somebody who says, I don't know if it's A or B, 50-50. Ah, and yet, probabilistic point of view, they are both treated exactly the same. Um, and there's a whole body of literature on this in the uh, things like Bayesian and methods, and there's been a lot of talk about uh, non-informed priors. You know, if, if you don't have any prior information, how do you do Bayesian updating? Well, you take the maximum entropy solution, it's uninformed. Well, if it's a coin toss, it's really informed. Uh, and we'll, I won't talk anymore about uh, Bayesian methods, but uh, uh, they're good for, well, I will. They're good for learning, they're good for improving, but they may not be the right starting point, and you may be better just doing, they turn out to be algebraically the same as doing things like maximum likelihood estimates, forgetting about Bayes' law and the prior to begin with. Um, so uh, if you believe in maximum entropy as your, or entropy as your measure of ignorance, the uncertainty in the M and the ignorance comes in. Um, there are other expressions when you have uh, non-countable domains uh, that behave the same as entropy. They f meet all the requirements. And, you know, it's, it may be hard to come up with an expression when you have a finite number of sets that you can reorder, but if you have a probability distribution and it's mapped to a real line and you have to integrate, the integration takes care of that issue, and almost anything you integrate is going to have that property, that if you integrate from A to B or A to C or A to B plus B to C, as long as you've got the same measure when you're done, you get the same result for the integral. Okay? This is actually... Uh, uh, done in a paper of a colleague of yours, whether you know him or not. He's in the math department here. Uh, uh, or at least was in uh, uh, 1997. Uh, um, the other thing that really bothers me as an engineer in saying that ignorance is measured by uh, entropy is if I don't know what the answer is, it should not depend on the variable that I pick to describe the process. 
if I pick stiffness or I pick flexibility to measure, maximum entropy will say, if I pick stiffness, it says take a uniform distribution for stiffness. If I pick flexibility, it says take a uniform distribution for flexibility. Stiffness is one over the flexibility, right? At least it was. Uh, and uh, th if I have a uniform distribution for one, it is definitely, the inverse is definitely not a uniform distribution. So it's not independent of scale. You know, the original example for this was in uh, current, or sorry, uh, impedance versus conductance, but you know, civil engineering community, I'm going to translate it to stiffness. Um, so it uh, may not be the best representation of ignorance, but it's the one that most people use. I mean, people say, I don't know what the answer is. Well, I'll take the maximum entropy distribution because you know, everybody knows entropy measures ignorance. Uh, uh, so there's uh, terms like subjective probability, entropy methods. Uh, that's one way to measure it. There's been people who have looked at measuring ignorance in a fuzzy domain and uncertainty in a probabilistic domain. Uh, it's complicated. It may work. Uh, uh, they're friends of mine, so I won't say anything more. Um, the way I think one of the ways you can look at it is just collect the results. I mean, present the data. It may be overwhelming in some cases, but we're no longer restricted to, you know, uh, 15 pages of data on a proposal. We, well, we are in a proposal, but, you know, you can reference things on the Internet and store a lot of information. Uh, but the way I'm going to say you should measure in ignorance is when you go from a sharp number or a sharp distribution, when it's uncertain, to giving bounds on that. So if I can bound the distribution, then what's ever between the bounds is a reasonable representation of the uncertainty in the system, and the width of the bounds himself represents the ignorance I have on the system, and I don't know which probability distribution is going to be correct. So that's what I'm advocating for. And therefore, talking about bounds leads me to intervals, uh, because I'm going to do a lot of the bounding calculations using uh, interval numbers. Uh, intervals are nothing more than tolerances. Uh, the original, or, uh, very original formulation had to do with dealing with round-off number. You know, uh, in computers, you know, you're never representing it exactly, so you have a lower bound and an upper bound that's a, a rational number. That makes it finite, but you, with the bounds, you cover the real. Uh, so it's typically expressed in terms of two numbers, a lower bound and an upper bound. Mathematically, it's typically considered a closed set um, for completeness. Uh, and uh, how to find these bounds, uh, confidence intervals from uh, probability theory is a way to, to generate these bounds, and you can actually propagate them through a system. Uh, the, uh, you know, limits on experimental results. If my uh, digital display has uh, three digits, then I'm never sure about the, the fourth digit, and I can represent it by bounds. Um, and uh, there may be physics that limit things. So the, uh, I'm sure in your parking garage that there are no trucks over 25 feet in height. Because if there were, there would be no parking garage. So, I mean, the, the physics of the problem give you constraints. And there's a lot of cases where people do bounds tests. You know, does it fit in this, this part fit? Yeah, it passes. Does it take this load? Yeah, it passes. So there are verification methods. So that's the usual representation. It's a closed set. Uh, you can develop matrices. Uh, uh, linear algebra extends. Uh, the uh, interval values of vectors are written in terms of interval values of components. Um, this has some bad properties when you go to really high dimensions, and this is one of uh, uh, Arnold Neumeier's comments. He has a system based on what he calls clouds. It's a very descriptive system for ellipses. Um, and in small problems, if you bound something by an ellipse versus bounding it by a box, it isn't bad, but as the dimension of the problem increases, the box gets much bigger compared to the ellipse, and therefore for high dimensional problems, he may have a better, he has a better solution. Uh, but this is easier to calculate with. And uh, there are typical uh, interval operators. You can take uh, any program you want and overload the operators, and all of a sudden it becomes an interval code. Uh, the only thing that's a problem, uh, well, let me get to the next slide. Um, and you, the signs matter. So things like multiplication are not straightforward because if you have a negative number on an upper bound, it may change the lower bound significantly of uh, the, the product. Um, 
Inc. It is commutative, it is associative, it is not distributed. Uh, so you have to be very careful in not assuming that there's an algebra. And that's a little bit strange for, for uh, uh, engineering students. You, know, you, you assume that you can do algebraic manip manipulations all day. This, uh, people even talk about interval algebra, and it's a misnomer if it's used in this sense. And there are ways to make it, into a, a, make it closed under algebra, but then you lose the idea of bounds because you have to allow bounds that go from two is a lower bound and minus six is an upper bound. Then you can close it under distributed properties, but then you don't know what to make as far as sense out of the answer. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to extend intervals to probability distributions. And this is going to be a P box, a probability box. And all I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the continuous distribu or cumulative distribution because it's got nice bounding properties other, anyway. It's monotonically non-decreasing. It's going to be increasing. It starts at 0, ends up at 1, and it can't go down. So the bounds look a little bit better and easier to represent. Uh, it was first, actually, I gave Scott Harrison the uh, credit for it. It's some group at uh, Sandia. Uh, but there's actually a PhD thesis uh, out of Australia in 1989 that describes this in perfect detail. Okay. So probability box. This is actually a picture from Scott Fierson's. It's not mine. Uh, I think all the lines are monotonically increasing. But all you're doing is saying any distribution that are between these two bounds is included in your possible set that you're going to calculate with. Okay. So you describe the bounds. You know, it's not a manifold. It's not parameterized. It's any continuous distribution that fits among this set. And that's going to be uh, defined in terms of the lower bound and upper bound. So let me get to dependency bounds. Uh, um, this is even a nicer toy problem. Uh, it wasn't considered a toy problem. It was actually proposed as a problem by Kolmogorov, which people take seriously just because of the name. Um, but this was, can you tell me what the bounds are on two probability distributions when I add them together uh, when I only know the marginals? Okay? Um, and it was proposed, I think, in the late 50s. Uh, it was first solved by Markov not a, you know, another high-powered guy, uh, in 1981. Uh, very complicated proof uh, and without Coppola's, without realizing the connection between that. And then uh, Frank at IIT actually developed the uh, uh, solution that I used as a proof, and it's just based on Coppola's. You take the lower Coppola bound, upper Coppola bound, look at the worst case, a little bit of optimization, and you're done. Nice, simple proof applies to all operators. It's really easy to extend. So what's the result? If I have two uniform distributed numbers and I add them together, the independent case is this S-shaped curve. And you know, it's the first, if you keep on adding uniform distributions, you'll eventually end up with a normal distribution, which will be similar S-shaped curve. Okay. Not surprising. The actual bounds are not the triangular distributions that you get from any correlation. The actual bounding values turn out to be a line here and a line here. So these two linear curves represent the p-box for the sum of two random variables that are uniformly distributed. Okay? And it's well larger than the, any correlation case. And in fact, it, you have to be clever to find the dependency that produces those bounds. Uh, one thing I should say are these are bounds. It doesn't mean that this is a solution. Okay? This is a bounds to the solution. There could be a whole bunch of probability distributions that are realizations, and this may be just the bounding collection of points that it actually is. Um, this is the correlated values from before. This is actually a series of parameterized distributions that are discontinuous. You assume a dependency, and then you jump up and assume a continued dependency. Um, it's linear, so it preserves the normal or uniform to uniform. You don't, uh, both variables are uniform. Each one looks something like this, jumps up, comes over, jumps up. Uh, but the bounds, come, these are the bounds that you would get. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about numerical methods on P boxes. Uh, I'm almost out of time. Okay. Um, it's a usual thing that happens. You, know, you time it. 
at the airport, and you have plenty of time in a half hour. And, uh, yeah. um, there are various techniques to doing manipulations or calculations using p-boxes or probability bounds, and they mirror what you can do in probability theory. So we can do calculations on p-boxes based on Monte Carlo techniques. And what happens is when you do Monte Carlo simulation with p-boxes, the Monte Carlo realization is an interval because you don't know where you're in on at the p-box, and then you do interval finite elements, collect the results, sort them, and you get a result. So it's Monte Carlo with intervals. Uh, you can do p-box calculation. Uh, we can develop overloaded operators. I have the C program that you know just declare a p-box, and all of a sudden the operator is a p-box, and I add them together, and I get another p-box, and uh, I can do computations uh, similar to if you have probability distributions that are discrete, and you try to do things uh, uh, on uh, probability arithmetic. And you may be able to, I think you can do polynomial chaos. And this is something I'm looking at right now uh, because there, it's not, you, what you do is represent the probability distribution by a parametric expansion of uh, orthogonal polynomials. Um, there's questions on uh, whether you're actually including the results or just estimating results. Uh, I may talk a little bit more on that. Okay. So the P-Box Monte Carlo, I just described it. Uh, you come in, that's where that figure, I like reusing figures, I like reusing proposals. You know. I shouldn't have to reuse proposals, but they get rejected every once in a while. Uh, so here, this is just an inverse method for getting a uniform distribution, but now we're using a P-Box. Uniform distribution, generate it, come across here, interval realization. Okay. Relatively straightforward. You have to do interval finite elements, which is a problem by itself. Um, when we first started doing interval finite elements, we found out that a whole bunch of people have tried this because there exists interval libraries. It looks like a quick paper. You just say, I have a finite element code. Instead of real star 8 in Fortran, you say, you know, uh, interval star 8 compiles, runs, gives you bounds. Bounds are correct, and they're completely useless. Uh, like the first time I ran this on a structural problem, it told me the deflection at the center of a reasonably designed bridge was somewhere between minus 57 kilometers and plus 98 kilometers. It's right. Yeah, there's no doubt. But I knew that before I started the calculation, and I really like to get answers that you contribute. Um, to get the right answer here, we had to break all the rules. We didn't assemble the element stiffnesses. We kept the interval parameters for element stiffnesses, pre-multiplying the stiffness, so we kept the dependency among variables. We stopped using distributed laws. Okay? Um, so we had to introduce constraints. You end up with a system of equations where the stiffness matrix is, the K is actually singular because it's just a stacked element stiffness. You got a zero on the lower diagonals. Uh, the people that we first presented, it was a SIAM conference, and they thought we were crazy. We took a really well-conditioned system of equations and made it look as about as bad as you can have a system equation be. This works. And it's a good thing about finite element techniques is the, the nice properties still remain. Even though it looks ugly, it's still positive, definite, symmetric, has this nice uh, condition number if you actually calculate it. So it looks horrid, but you get good results. Um, well, we've... Uh, uh, if you try doing this exactly, it's actually NP-complete. Uh, and Vlad Krenovich uh, proved this. Uh, so that would mean you can't solve anything because, you know, you double the size of the problem and it becomes impossible. But good engineers can get close enough bounds. So we developed techniques based on fixed-point theorem that iterates. And, you know, I can't prove it's the, that they're the tightest bounds I can get, but they are always bounds. And they seem to match the all combination data that we generate with a lot of computer time. Um, and uh, there's some other issues in how to do nonlinear analysis, et cetera, that I'll skip. I'll skip the details here. The equations look messy. Uh, and uh, what I'm going to do then is uh, look at uh, P boxes and uh, do numerical calculations to try to figure out what the dependency is in that truss. And this is uh, one of the ex implementations. Uh, one of the implementations we have is to use intervals to bound the P-box. Okay, so that makes it more of an interval problem and easier to do in the implementations of arithmetic operators on intervals. 
Uh, this is, again, a toy picture. You would never use this course of a discretization of a probability distribution. Uh, when I show the results, you'll see that they're a lot better. But here, bounding, 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 bounding. And one of the things we tried to do is guarantee that we're mathematically rigorous, that our answers are provable bounds based on the input data. Okay? So there are tricks that you can do to get better results, better looking results. You know, this would be guaranteeing bounds. This would be taking averages. This is a better discretization. It has less error into it. You know, this is the best discretization of piecewise constants you can do on that shape. Uh, we've stuck with the bounding condition because my end results then are provable to be bounds on the response. Um, Look a little bit about polynomial chaos. Uh, uh, John uh, Redhorse at Sandia has published a couple of things. Uh, there's a Galerican, uh, when you do an infinite series, it looks nice on paper. When you actually apply it, you truncate it and map to the same polynomials. So you do a Galerican projection on the same space over and over again. That's not a bounding operator. So I'm not sure that we're actually preserving the bounds. And on certain parameters, the bounds will cross. And then you're back to the any correlation where the line crosses and you can have one point that has to be there. And that's not necessarily representing all the ignorances. So let me give you some results. I'll only give you one. Uh, this is the first problem, uh, cross-sectional geometry, elastic module. This is a reasonably designed truss. Uh, I'm going to define the loads based on uh, uncertainty uh, or confidence intervals. So I actually had collected data. Somebody else collected data. I pulled it out of a textbook. And then fit uh, using log normal distributions. Uh, this is the confidence bounds based on the data set that we had. I'm not going to print up the data. Uh, that would guarantee the mean parameters uh, mean to be within these two values. Okay? And I'm going to concentrate on 90%. You can do any calculation and propagate it through. You have to be a little bit careful how you do this because if you just propagate it through, you know, the results are no longer confidence intervals. Uh, but there's some recent work that allows people to propagate confidence intervals through calculations, but then you can't do any dependency right now. So you can do one or the other, but not both. And, uh, uh, here's your answer. Uh, this is a comparison between the uh, discrete p-boxes, you know, the overloaded operator on a finite element code, and the Monte Carlo technique when they're independent. And the discrete p-boxes always uh, are outside the true solution, the Monte Carlo, because there's no guarantee that you're going to converge from one side or the other. Uh, you're just going to converge. Sometimes it's inside, sometimes it's outside. But they're reasonable comparisons, except at the tail, uh, where we just have very poor information on the p-boxes. The correct way to do this is to take much finer p-boxes where you're in interest. The easy way to program it is to take all the discretizations uniform. And uh, that's the next student job to implement the variable discretization. Okay. What happens about dependency? Well, these are the bounds with independent calculations. This is the impact of not knowing the dependency among variables. And you can calculate the bounding distributions for not knowing the dependency. And I could actually shrink these down and determine just the bounds associated with not knowing the dependency. And it's very significant. You can be off by orders of magnitude in the tail regions between the dependent case and the independent case. And the depend any dependency case is always worse. It doesn't make any difference if you're at the top or the bottom of the curve. You're always expanding the lack of knowledge, and therefore your bounds are getting wider. <laughs> I'm not going to do another example. Uh, you can do nonlinear problems. I mean, it really is a toy problem that allows you to do almost any finite element uh, displacement-based techniques. So I have two conclusions, and then I'll be glad to answer any more questions. Um, first is that the behavior of linear and nonlinear structures with unknown dependency among random variables and loading, uh, you can have unknown moduluses, geometry, loads, uh, can be bounded using the concept of p-boxes. So you can do it. And uh, the summaries I really want to get across to students, which has nothing to do with science, is that be critical of the assumptions that you make. Okay? 
Just because everybody else makes the same assumption doesn't mean that it's the only thing you could do. It makes life easier, you know, normal, independent, but it may not tell you what's really going on in the problem. Second, it's really easy to go to Wikipedia and pull out an equation and say, oh, well, that's the theorem, you know, maximum entropy, it's been proved, this is a unique answer. Well, it's not unique in most of the cases that it's applied to. You know? We don't do very many, well, I don't do very many finite uh, sets in probability. I've always got, random, or always got uh, variables that are continuous. Yeah. So know the assumptions that go into your results. Uh, so when you apply them, even if they're wrong, you, know, you can do that as an engineer. You can say, well, they're not that wrong. You, know? uh, you can do it in economics, you know, representing the uncertainty by the variance in, in the black, uh, I'm missing something. Black something. Scholes. No, Scholes I know, but is it Black Scholes? Yeah, okay, yeah, sorry, I thought it was Black something Scholes. I don't know Black, I know Scholes. Um, uh, you know, it's wrong, but it's a good estimate and it worked. You know, um, and you get a Nobel Prize. That's usually worthwhile. It guarantees tenure. Well, it almost guarantees tenure. Um, at some places, if you haven't brought in research money, it may not be enough, but anyway. Uh, and um, last thing is that you know, you, your ten and tendency was a graduate student. I'm going to solve the complicated, most complicated problem on earth because I can do it. And I'm going to impress everybody because I can do 600,000 degrees of freedom. And uh, you know, if I do something like that, nobody can check my answer anyway. Um, I, I didn't want to give away some of your secrets, but that's one of them. Uh, but even simple problems, if you look deeply at them, are not necessarily simple. You know, the, the toy trust problem, when you ask the right question, or ask a certain question, it's not easy to come up with an answer. And you had to, you know, I had to pull from all sorts of areas of mathematics just to try to get a handle on what's going on. And that's not unusual. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, I will, this is my favorite uh, picture of uh, what I do. As usual, if you have questions, please wait for the mic. Questions? Randall? While I might want to argue with you on some of your technical points, okay. I have a, a, a bigger problem. Every time I give probabilistic analysis, regardless of how good or how bad my assumptions are, et cetera, the people I give it to don't know how to deal with it. How do you explain a P-box bound to a design engineer? Um, I pick my design engineers. Uh, there is a group in, at Sandia who is very concerned about predicting reliability of nuclear fuses. Okay. They pay attention. They worry about things like that. Um, I think as, you know, I may have repeated this to some of you in the audience already, but the civil engineering profession did a great disservice to the structural engineers when they decided to put together a probabilistic based code without any mention of probability. You know, the, the code, you, you, the, the researchers came up with the uh, factor, uh, LFRD, load factors, uh, uh, but uh, they hid it from the engineers. Uh, the ABET Committee uh, on Accreditation, I think, just re well, we moved uh, probability and statistics from the ASCE program criteria. I think it may be back. I mean, it goes back and forth, and I'm, I got time before I have to worry about that again. But, um, you know, for some reason, what I think is crucial to an engineer, we have to determine how reliable something is. If it's over reliable, it's not usually economically feasible. Okay? It's good that computers break. Okay? Because otherwise I'd be still using car punches. You know? The machine would be working and there'd be no technology advances. Uh, it's not good that the computer flying the plane that I took to Minneapolis broke, or it didn't break. But I mean, there I want more reliability. Um, I think we have to think in terms of reliability and teach students to think in terms of reliability, because that's the only way you're going to change the profession, is to change them while they're students. Um, I, I can talk forever, I'm not going to, but um, there is, yeah, the, the, the knowledge of most people about probability uh, is 
dangerous. Okay? You, you assume that everything is simple. You know, 50-50, oh yeah, I can multiply by half. It's a quarter when I take two of them. I understand probability, I'm done. And it's a complicated field. There's a, a lot of meat into almost everything. Um, so I can't answer your question, uh, but we should do structural design with probability in mind. There are mechanical engineering people that actually do reliability design, uh, I think, close to being correct. And they make assumptions, but they know they made the assumptions. Any questions? I don't want to scare people. I won't answer all of them that long. <laughs> Yeah. Just hold on. Oh, could I just talk into the mic because we're recording it? I was wondering if you looked at the I-35 bridge falling down. You, you looked at that with probability. Um, uh, probability was one. It happened. I have no uncertainty that it's going to happen. <laughs> yep. uh, uh, that was an easy question. Next question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have looked at more complicated structures. Uh, I've done, you know, uh, I mean, I brought something. I can do finite elements with interval techniques. I mean, it's not a, a problem. Uh, it's also very efficient uh, compared to alternative looking at combinations doing sensitivity analysis. Um, the problems that I have looked at are smaller and more critical. Now, I know a bridge going down is critical. Uh, one of the areas that I'm working with a pharmacist on, uh, I have a colleague in South Carolina who came from Northwestern uh, who is an MD looking at the safety of drugs. And he can identify side effects based on uh, that occur one in a million, one in 10 million. And his trick that I finally realized is he uses important sampling. He doesn't know he uses important sampling, but he realized that if a physician doesn't know what's wrong with you, they will send you to have electrophoresis. You know, that's one of the techniques. I don't know what's wrong. Send him, treat him with electrophoresis. Get something out of his blood. There has to be something in there. You know, it's like bleeding when there were barbers in the 18th or 17th century. Um, so he has, you know, there's seven sites around the country that do electrophoresis on large number of populations. He monitors those sites. He works with the people there. When they see a cluster, they look at the drugs that they've taken, and all of a sudden he's been able to, well, he does well in publishing a new, uh, new uh, England Journal of Medicine. He, he claims that there's black boxes, which are what they put, the FDA makes you put in when there's side effects that may be dangerous. And he, every time there's a commercial that you hear about a drug and it says, you may have, if you sit have serious muscle pain, which is one of the common side effects that trigger a reaction that will kill you. Uh, you know, if you see the warning that says, you know, may cause muscle pain, see a physician immediately, Charlie Bennett did it. I mean, that was his work by important sampling. So we're trying, I've been trying to get the SCDOT to share their maintenance records. And they now have a, you know, the data is actually available, it's not very clean, uh, and construction records. Um, and I postulate right now, and you guys can do the work if you want because I'll never probably publish it because I'll never get around to it, but uh, if the project was under duress during construction, the collection of projects that have delay times, over costs, those are my targeted samples that maybe I should do more bridge monitoring on because I can't afford to monitor all the bridges. But those are the ones where the, maybe the construction people may have said, oh, the inspector's gone, more water in the concrete. Or, you know, because they're behind schedule. They got pressure to complete things. Um, and those are the ones that I think are correspond to his electrophoresis when it comes to bridge structures are the ones that had problems during construction. And, uh, you know, maybe you can invite me back in a couple of years and I have the SCDOT data. I can show you a P-box with the uh, changes in bounds uh, when you important sample only on the uh, pro projects that had significant cost overruns or time overruns. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One more question from uh, Charles Young. And then, by the way, you guys, I'm sure Bob will be oh, yeah. more I'll be than glad happy to answer, answer questions of the wine and cheese. Uh, very nice talk. I just wonder, can you comment on how these bounds will impact the low factors we use in design now? The safety factor for loads. 
So if we consider interdependency of the loads, how that will change the load factors we used? Well, I think you, they will increase. Um, that's an a easy answer. Uh, the, I think if you use just any dependency, you will overestimate considerably. If I do like a scour wind, uh, you will never be able to build a bridge. I mean, it would be massive. Uh, but any dependency, there's a lot of other dependencies where the P box bounds have been worked out recently. Things like uh, uh, positive dependency gives you sort of a, a, a crescent shaped bound. Uh, different than positive correlation, but just positive base dependencies. Uh, there's all sorts of, you know, there's probably 20 d descriptions of dependencies that vary in the literature, and those may be more realistic. You know, like, I don't think you're going to have a rainstorm and no wind, or negative wind. I'm not sure what, you know, lifting up the bridge is going to mean. Uh, or, or uh, but, uh, I, I saw, but I do think there may be positive correlated. You know, strong wind, thunderstorm, you know, hurricane, a lot of water. So, you know, looking at stronger po positive uh, dependencies, I think may actually be useful. And we have a lot of historical data that it fits. So I'm not sure that they don't already include a lot of these effects because of the history database that we have. Okay. Well, thanks again, uh, Bob. And uh, my pleasure.